When it comes to making fine-tuned edits to your photos in Photomator, your bread and butter is going to be layers and masks, which is exactly what we're going to cover today. Welcome to episode four of the Photomator Masterclass, where we're going over every single feature Photomator has to offer and showing you how to get the best for your photos. To get started, make sure you just grab the project files at the link down below. And if you haven't watched the previous episodes, you probably should, because we're just going to move forward assuming you know how some of the reliant tools that we're going to be building on top of already work. All right, with that said, today's structure is going to be similar to last time. I'm gonna start by giving you a demo of how all the tools work, and then we're going to jump into a real edit, and I'm gonna talk you through my thought process and the goal that I'm trying to achieve with the photo. So with that said, let's just jump right into the edit. This is the part of the video where you just sit back, relax, and watch as I demonstrate what all of these layers and masks do. And then after we're finished, we'll jump into the photo from the project file so you can follow along and actually use some of these tools in practice. Your layers and masks are accessed from right up here. You need to make sure that you're in edit mode first. But once you're in edit mode, you can open this layer menu to view what every photo will have, which is a basic layer that everything is built on top of. From here, you have two options for adding new layers or new masks to your image. Now, the reason why I keep saying layers and masks, it's because this one is kind of a layer and these ones are masks. And in fact, I will go one further. This one stands out because it's a layer. These three are grouped because these are the AI powered masking tools. These three are grouped because these are the manual masking tools. And this one down here in the bottom on its own, honestly, I could see it categorized because it is also manual. It's a different kind of manual, if that makes sense. And I'm guessing that they left themselves some space to expand because there's other similar kinds of selections you might want to make. So, so I'm guessing they did it, but it's layer, AI powered, manual, and then a different kind of manual mask. So let's just start from the top. Adjustments I want to get out of the way because it is different from all the others. When you add adjustments, all it does is it gives you this nice clean slate on top of the edits you've already done. So let's say, for example, you were toying with making the edit a little bit cooler, which that's kind of nice, but maybe you are concerned and you don't want to commit to that. You have this layer that you can just toggle on and off. And down here you have this intensity. So let's say it was more than just a single coolness slider. Maybe I made a bunch of edits and I thought, hey, you know what? I'm not sure this exact edit is the one I want. Maybe I want something in between the two edits. You can actually dial back the intensity of any of your adjustment layers or masks. So adjustment layer is a really cool tool. I don't use it as much, but it's really great if you're experimenting with different edits because you can isolate them to these individual layers and then use the intensity slider to combine them after the fact. So with that one unique outlier out of the way, let's jump into the AI powered masking tools. So the first is select subject. I will say it is best for selecting people, but I have had select subject work on pets and buildings and cars and all sorts of things. Like often, if there is something that is the primary subject of your photo, it does an okay job of figuring it out. And so even if this doesn't perfectly get the job done, I will often start with this as the starting point and then I will clean up or refine the mask, you know, for example, if it's a car and it didn't exactly get the wheels or something. Two below select subject, you have select background, which from what I can tell is literally just the opposite, which is interesting. You'll see why in a minute, but it's here. So that's an option that you have available to you. The other is select sky and select sky is really great. Again, sort of like select subject. If I want to do something to the sky, I always use this as a starting point, regardless of how weird or differently colored or rotated my image might be because at a minimum, it gives me a good starting point. And you can see because of the depth of field and the way the light is coming through, it had a little hard time with the edge here. So in this case, I would select the sky as the starting point, make my edits, and then I would go through with another tool and clean up the edges, which I will show you how to do. So that's the AI powered masking tools. Now our manual masking tools are exactly what they sound like. They're manual. So brush lets you literally go along and paint in a mask with a brush, or you can erase with the brush. And it's super nice because you can dial up the brush size. So if you try to paint in big areas, you can change how hard or how soft. So in this case, 
you can see hard versus soft, and you can even dial in the opacity. So maybe I don't want this mask to be equally strong everywhere, or maybe I'm trying to clean up an edge. And so I've got something that's nice and soft and kind of low opacity, and I can just do a little clicking here to soften up and clean up some edges. So really cool manual tool. This is going to come up probably in the majority of edits where you're doing masking, because you'll do some cleanup with your mask at some point. Next are linear and radial. These are basically the same tool. One just goes in a straight line, one goes in an oval or a circle. So linear, you get a line on the screen. You can rotate it by just moving your cursor outside the edges here. You can grab the edges to change how sharp that line is. And you can really see this uh, in later edits where if we don't make the line soft enough, it becomes really obvious there's a mask. And then of course you can change the position of it. Radial is exactly the same. So you have a center point. You can change the size in both directions. And then you can also rotate it too. If you need that to, for example, match the shape of somebody's face. But both tools behave basically the same, pretty straightforward. Now, the final one, and the reason why I said this is sort of a different kind of manual mask is color range. So color range gives you this option to pick a color. In this case, I'm gonna grab this sort of yellowy green right here, and it automatically picks everything that is the same color. Now, how much it bleeds outside of that color is adjustable. But the thing that I have found and what makes this tool particularly interesting is that it, for example, you can see even just going up like this much, it's already picking up yellows, oranges, and even like a little green bounce light in like my face and in my shirt, even though orange and blue aren't exactly the same color as these trees, you really can quickly start picking up too much of your image. And sort of the same way, if you go the other direction, you really quickly can start losing too much. So like if my goal was to select these trees, it's actually kind of hard to find the right balance where I'm not getting anything in my face and I'm not affecting all of the trees in the background. So typically what I will do, and I will show you how to do this, combine this mask with another kind of mask. Is typically what I'll do. So I'll use this as a tool to refine my selection further than maybe what the gradient or the brush did or the sky or something. So with that said, you have an idea of all of the mask tools that are available. Let's go get the actual photo from the project files and walk you through the edit of a real photo. Okay, this is the project file we'll be working from. Once you get the image loaded, you might see this message if your display doesn't support HDR. Doesn't matter, you can just go ahead and close it. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to get this to a much more dramatic, moody edit, which to be fair, it was a very overcast rainy day. So like it felt dramatic and moody at the time. Uh, so let's see if we can mirror some of that. So let's start by opening the edit tools and we're just gonna do a basic adjustment with the white balance and the basic color adjustments. If you want to see how to do that, you can watch the previous video where we go into this in more detail. So. I usually associate dramatic with cold and dark. So I'm gonna do that. And I'm just gonna, so I'm just gonna darken this up actually quite a bit, even dial up that black point. The one thing that I'm really aware of is I, I want this white waterfall to stand out as the centerpiece of this image. So we're gonna dial up the texture and the clarity just a little bit. Now this is a pretty good starting point, but let's go ahead and jump in with our masks. So the first thing that we can do that is really easy is we don't have a subject or a background really, but we do have a sky. So let's select the sky. As you can see, it does a pretty good job right out the box getting that skyline. I will probably want to paint into this a little bit more, but it's pretty dang close. Now with the sky, something that you can do often is dial up the texture or the clarity just to make the storm clouds look a little bit more dramatic. Now that's pretty good, but I might even toy with taking it a little bluer as well. Just really add to that drama. Now you can see before 
and after it's pretty strong. So you can also dial back the intensity. I actually am kind of okay with it, but I'll, let's start it at like 90%. And as I mentioned, I wasn't sure how this um, top line was actually going to look. And I think actually after the ad supplied, it looks pretty clean. So I'm gonna leave that as is. So I've not, now that I've got this, one thing that might not be obvious is that the sky mask is bleeding into the waterfall a little bit. So if I show and hide this, you can actually see it has some impact right there. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to subtract from this mask. So I will just go ahead and I will select with a brush and I will make this about this size and we're just gonna subtract all of this area right here. So now you can see from the thumbnail that the little white speck is gone there. If I hide and show, the waterfall doesn't change colors, which is what we want. Next, I wanna bring some of the emphasis here on the waterfall. So let's go ahead and add a radial gradient. I'm really gonna play with this and make it look like there's just a spotlight shining down right on top of this waterfall here. So maybe a little bit skinnier to try to match the curve of this little canyon carve out spot where the water has weathered away the rock, but something like that. And now for the waterfall, I might make it a little extra blue, or I could even go the opposite, right? I could make it warm too. Now, in this case, I actually think Blue makes more sense. We tend to associate cools and blues with, with whiteness. That's why like the bleach in your laundry turns your clothes a little bit blue is because we perceive that as whiter. Um, so I'm gonna make it a little bit blue, but I'm also going to just dial up the exposure a little bit. Now this might seem obvious as you're watching this thinking like, oh my gosh, yeah, you can see this totally artificial blown out area, but once you step away from it and you see this as a whole thing, it's not quite as obvious. That actually looks all right. Maybe I can even play with the shadows and the contrast just to give it a little bit more. But this is the before and the after with the radial gradient. Now, I think it's always a good practice every once in a while to check in and make sure your edits are going the direction you want them to go. So if we just hit this before, and after, you can see we've already actually made a really big difference to this photo. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is this ground here that I'm standing on is pretty distracting. So I'm gonna throw down one more linear gradient, just right down here. And I'm gonna to try to match it up to this ledge. So something about like that. And if I was getting really crazy with it, I would even go and brush in plants and things like that, but I don't think it's super necessary for the effect we're gonna get. So I'm just gonna crazy dial back uh, the brightness and the exposure. And that, if I actually go like this, that actually feels okay as is. Let me, let me bring just a little bit back just a little bit. Might even just dial up the black point as well, because if this really was in shadow, like the blacks would be quite black. And I wonder, it's not necessary, but even just dialing back the texture and the clarity a little bit helps remove it as an area of focus. So again, let's take a look at the before and after. And that's not half bad. There is one experiment that I want to try though. If I come back over here to the raw layer, what happens if I make the whole image warm instead of cool? And the reason why I'm experimenting with this is because if you remember, we made the sky cool and we made the waterfall a little bit more cool. And so taking the outside or the outside edges of the picture in a warmer direction while well, we take the focus areas in a cooler direction can add a lot of contrast to it. Now maybe I won't go all the way to making it, you know, warm, but I'll just do something like that. 
And you have to be sensitive too, because this is the base layer. So you can see if I go like that, these stack on top of each other. And so because the cloud layer is on top, it is getting affected by this warmth, even though we made it cooler. So let's maybe just do a little bit like that. Let's see, before and after. Now, if you wanted to get really dramatic with it, I, I could even see a world where you threw down an extra gradient down here to really block out the light from this area and take the exposure down even further. I wouldn't fault you for doing that. And I could also 100% see a world where we introduce maybe a linear gradient on the sides, just on this edge, and we introduce and we combine that with another linear gradient on the other side, something like that. So we can switch between our gradients here by clicking their little handles. And then using this new mask to dial back the sides as well. So you're creating almost a, a vignetting effect over here on the sides dialing up the black point and the contrast. Maybe that's too much contrast. We're getting that black point. So I could totally see uh, doing something like that as well, although I don't think it's necessary. So let me show you. We have our layer stack here with our two linear gradients. I can collapse this so it looks like a single mask. But if I turn this on and off, like it definitely does help pull your eye towards the center of the pic picture. Um, but it's also just a little bit stronger of an edit. So I don't know. Tell me what you think in the comments below. I think I'm going to get rid of this radial gradient. I don't think it needs it. And then uh, I'll leave the side gradients on because I think that looks pretty nice. Now, the last thing I will show you before we close this out, you do have options under this try dot menu that aren't just adding more to the image or taking away. So for example, one thing that you might do is keep track of your, of your named layers so that when you come back to your edit, they make sense. The other is duplicating or duplicating and inverting. Because as I was showing you, sometimes it's nice to do cool one way and warm the other direction to increase that color contrast. And a quick way to do that is just to duplicate and invert if you want to keep things separate. Or if you realize that you did your mask backwards and you selected the outside instead of the inside, you can just do invert mask. So that's another option you have available as well. With all that said, that's the final edit. Let me know what you think in the comments below. All right, that's it for episode four. If you liked it and you want early access to the next episode, make sure you support me here on YouTube or over on Patreon where you'll get early access to all of my videos. If there was something I didn't cover very clearly and you have some questions, go ahead and leave those in the comments below and we'll catch you on the next time. Thanks for watching.